In 1951, when Fender began selling precision basses, they sold for $200, which if you do some inflation math, comes up to $2,500 today. And at the time, that was basically your only option. Squire didn't exist until the 80s, and so your only option for cheap basses was to buy one out of the Sears catalog, along with your Roy Rogers costume and a whole ass house. These days though, you can buy a bass for basically whatever price you want, all the way from $100 to $100,000. So the million dollar question here is, what do you give up by buying a cheap bass, and what do you gain by buying a really expensive one? And where's the spot in the middle where you get the most bass for the least amount of money? And also, how am I going to work Elden Ring into this script? So in the very basement of the budget pile, we have the $100 to $200 range. This is about the least amount of money that you can pay to get a functional base. And a lot of the popular brands that you're going to find at this range are brands like Glary or Polar or Donner. And they're basically all the same thing. They're these Chinese imports that popped up not, not too long ago and started selling these impossibly cheap bases. And they've cut so many corners on these things that these bases are a metaphorical circle. I would say that probably one of the biggest weaknesses of a base like this is the tuning machines up here at the top. The metals that they use for these tend to be pretty soft, and so they wear out really, really fast, and they don't hold a tune very well, so you're going to be turning them a lot more often than you would on a nicer instrument, which just makes them wear out even faster. And then they feel like a really crappy can opener, they're like sticky and kind of garbage. They're functional, but they're not good. Moving on down, let's talk about the necks on these things, because the neck that I had on my Glary was extremely chunky. And I don't think that they do that to hit like some vintage spec or whatever. I think they make the necks thicker because they're more stable. And when you're using poorer quality cuts of wood, that's kind of a mitigating factor that you can add to it to make it so that your neck stays put. So you do sacrifice some playability because the neck is chunkier, but you do have a little bit more stability in spite of the materials you're using. Pros and cons there. And while we're on the topic of woods, the body woods that they use for these are just like scraps of whatever they can find to glue together. So if you if you want a painted one, it'll usually look okay. They don't do a great job with the finishes. They'll have like paint runs in them or like spots where you can almost kind of see the, the wood underneath, but like, it's, it's better than having the bare wood because the natural finishes on these look terrible because the wood looks terrible. Now, I don't subscribe to the whole tone wood thing, so for now, we're just going to put that idea in a box, close the lid, put it up on the shelf, and pretend that it does not exist. For now. Oh, they're making fretless ones now. Huh. That's really interesting. But let's talk about the electronics because that was actually, I felt like the strong point of the Glary that I had. The pickups they put on these bases are actually pretty okay. And on the uh, the slightly upgraded ones, like the one that I had, I thought it was a great sounding pickup. I think it was a Wilkinson pickup. Why do I even have headphones on? I'm not listening to anything. But while the pickups are fine, I found the electronics to be a little bit lacking overall, especially because they don't shield the control cavity, which is this empty space that exists under the, the pit guard so that you can put in the, the wires and everything. And nicer bases you'll have some copper shielding under there which prevents outside interference from introducing like hum or static or other unwanted noise but on these bases they don't do that because it's 120 bucks and of course they're not going to do anything that's unnecessary now the reason why i'm showing you this instead of the base itself is because i don't have my glary anymore i gifted it to my my nephew last christmas and a year later he is still playing it which kind of brings me to my last point here that if this is the only kind of money you have to spend on a base then that's okay. You can definitely learn to play on something this cheap. Or if you just have a little bit more money in your budget to begin with, what I would recommend is going to the next step up. Now stepping up into this next tier is going to almost double your budget, but I think it is worth the investment because the instruments in this price range are pretty dang good, especially within the last 15 years or so. Brands like Fender, Gibson, and Ernie Ball all have budget alter ego brands like Squire, Epiphone, and Sterling. While well, we're on the topic of Sterling, I've got to rant for just a second because Sterling is Music Man's budget brand, but it's also a model of bass that they make that tends to be pretty nice and high end. Also, between the time of me filming and editing this, this popped up on the Sterling Instagram, so that's fun. So I'd like to say a few words to the person at Ernie Ball who said that that was a good idea, starting with, what the fuck, man? What were you thinking? That is so dumb and bad and confusing. And don't you dare at me, because I have all the achievements in Elder Ring. And they make basically the same exact instruments that they make at the top end, but just with some cheaper parts and a different name on the headstock. 
The Squire Classic Vibe basses in particular come as a top recommendation for me. These basses are fantastic. I've got a P and a J from the same series, and I've been very happy with both of them. The tuning machines are great, the neck is stable, and the electronics are solid, and the pickups sound great. Because these basses are built to the exact same specifications as the more expensive ones, if there's something about this that you don't like, it's really, really easy to mod it so that you can put better tuning machines in it, or different pickups, or a different bridge, or even replace the neck altogether. I haven't really done a whole lot of mods to my basses beyond just like a different pick guard, but, but I could if I wanted to, and that's worth something. If that weren't enough, these are actually perfectly giggable basses too. I've taken this and my other classic vibe to many a gig and they've done just fine and great in fact. And the bonus here is that because these are so cheap, if something happens to it, it gets broken or stolen, it's not a big deal to just outright replace it because it was only like three or four hundred bucks. So you might be thinking, that sounds great. Why would you ever pay any more for a bass? Are there even any downsides to something like this? And yeah, there are a couple. The tuning machines on these bases are still the weakest point, in my opinion. They just don't... Is that rust? So yeah, like in addition to them being kind of cheap, they can also be like these bigger style, which are a little bit heavier, which makes the balance of the bass suffer a little bit. Not a huge deal because, like I said, you can replace these if they're a problem. The other thing about bases in this price range are that they tend to be a little bit less consistent than they should be. You're just as likely to get a great base as you are to get a lemon, and so it's always best to try before you buy. In fact, I went through dozens of bases that are this exact same base before I finally landed on this one, and you can see it's got a little damage at the bottom of it, but the neck on it is really what I was looking for, and it took me a long time to find one that I really, really liked. But this bass is fantastic, and I cannot believe that I walked out of the, the Guitar Center with this for like 250 bucks, I think. This bass is great. But just know that yours might not be quite the same. I always have to look at reviews of basses in this price range with a, with a little bit of skepticism because that review usually applies to just that base and not all of them collectively unless they're reviewing multiples, which nobody does that, so that's not gonna happen. So let's leave the budget land for a little bit and let's talk about the $500 to $1,500 range because this is where you start to get into the serious base territory. At this price point, you're getting quality woods, good hardware, solid electronics, and features like shielded cavities or like on this Yamaha, this low battery indicator, which should just be a standard feature on every active base in my opinion. Everybody's so far behind Yamaha right now. The finishes on these bass tend to be really, really well done. You'll get great fret work, and oftentimes you'll even get like a gig bag or a hard case with your purchase. There's a good chance that if you buy a bass in this price range, for example, this Yamaha cost me about $850, you'd never need another bass. This will last your whole life if you take care of it, and it'll be great the whole time. Now, I know a lot of people like to put a lot of stock in country of origin as some indicator of quality, but I think that these days that's just not a thing. I know quite a lot of people who don't think that the made in Mexico fenders are any better than the ones they make in America. And based on my experience, that's kind of true. This bass was made in Indonesia, and I think it's fantastic in every way. I have no problems with this bass whatsoever. Now, I've mentioned this on other videos that I've done, but because of manufacturing technology improvements like CNC machines, you can make great basses anywhere and make them really consistent. And that's kind of what you get for this tier of bass, is that you can pretty safely buy these sight unseen. Like, I bought this off the internet, it arrived, and it was great. And that's the kind of thing that you can expect when you spend this much on a bass. But what if money was not an object, and you wanted something with a little bit more of a handmade feel that was built exactly the way you want it? Well, now we're getting into the world of custom basses. You've seen this one before on my channel. This is my Sarek Lincoln. This is custom built by a small shop out of Chicago. And this thing is perfect. Custom bases like this give you complete and total freedom over every aspect of it. Depending on which builder you go to, you can get exactly the kind of neck profile you want, exactly the kind of electronics, the, the body style, the color, everything can be customized exactly to your preferences. Now, of course, these bases are expensive. Both of my Sarics cost right around $3,000 a piece, but the other thing that nobody talks about is the wait time. I waited for this base after I ordered for about eight months before it got delivered, and my Armitage took about 13 months. Now, that seems like a long time, but it was absolutely worth it to me to get something that I, I really, really wanted and knew that I would just really love and get a lot of value out of. 
But I also recognize that nobody needs to spend this much money on a base. This is totally gratuitous and unnecessary. A base that costs half this much would do the job just as well. I just happened to really, really like the look of these bases, and I got exactly what I wanted from them, and I couldn't be happier with these. But as expensive as these are, what if I told you that we can go even higher? Like, quite a lot higher. in the basement with Dr. Denson Angula once again. Hey, welcome to my space. Denson also has a fine collection of very, very nice instruments. And today I wanted to talk about what about these makes them worth so much money. Why do I have such expensive instruments? The first time I ever played a Federa was at Victor Wooden's base camp. And uh, I, I have a picture of me playing his Federa um, and I remember holding that bass and just thinking like, I've heard so many recordings done on this instrument. It, it blew me away to, to hold it, you know? It's like, it, it, it was just this tactile, I don't know, you know? It reminds me of that scene in Star Trek where Data asks Captain Picard when he touches the Zephram Cochran warp machine, you know? Like, what's the big deal of touching something for a human, you know? And it was just magical to hold Victor's bass for the first time in my life. And I always thought, oh my gosh, I, I want a Federa. I want one so bad. Well, fast forward years later, um, you know, my, my custom instruments that I purchased, um, I had a custom Conklin 7-string, and that was probably the most expensive bass I ever had. And it cost me about nine grand at the time. And I saved up and used gig money to buy it and stuff. And... And then any other custom stuff after that, I was using the Carbon factory. And Carbon's now Kiesel, um, but I had a few cu custom Carbon bases. But those, you just, they're kind of like made to order. You know, you pick what you want and they build them. There's no real interaction with any of the artisans that work there. And most of that stuff is CNC machined anyway. Well, I was talking with a friend, his name's Rob, and he's like, you know what, man? You're such a great bass player, you need a Federa. And I was like, uh... I can't afford a Federa. I, you know, I had, at the time I had four kids, one on the way. Uh, no, five kids and one on the way. <laughs> five kids and one on the way. Like, I was, I was working my guts out, trying to make ends meet with playing gigs, teaching lessons, teaching at the university. And I was like, there's no way I could afford a, a Federa. And I, and I looked at uh, options. Like, how could I get one? And I looked at how much they were, and I was just like, oh, there's no way I could get a custom one. There's no way. You can buy the standard line, like from Sweetwater or Slap Store. There's a bunch of distributors that will sell Fuderas. But even the standard ones start at like five grand and go up. Well, I, I was doing a gig with my dad, who had a production company, and I was an arranger for his orchestra. He had the full orchestra, and I was doing orchestral arrangements. And he had a whole list, like 20, 25 deep, of arrangements. And so I reached out to him and was like, Hey, Dad, <laughs> can I get paid for these up front? And uh, so we got under contract, and I did all the arrangements, and he cut me a check, a five-figure check. And I reached out to Fudera and I was like, Hey, I would love a custom base. How, what do I got to do? And I, so I had all this gig money all up front, and I was able to pay for this base, basically in cash. And then I worked it off through my dad working, working on those arrangements. And uh, when I got it, it, it blew me away. So I have an unboxing video that, that you can check out. Probably just right down there, right? And it changed my life to have an instrument like this. The thing about Foderas especially, there are a few things about them that I can that I can immediately tell you. They sound amazing and they feel amazing in my hands. They feel so good, and everything that I want to do with them uh, happens. Like I'm not limited by, you know, I try to get a sound and I just can't get that sound, or you know, like 
I can make it sound close to you know whatever kind of instrument I want. I can do a like a P bass kind of sound. really sort of like nasally bright instrument you know there's only so much I can do with a P bass there's only so much I can do with a jazz bass and you know I can play any gig I, I would ever encounter on this one bass which is really cool um, so the craftsmanship the detail the the artistry there's like like everything is just perfectly meticulously put together yeah sh show me that uh, that neck joint there Oh my gosh! The way and it's this, sculpted is, and just... this is carved by hand. Uh, I think my my buddy at the shop, Dan, carved this, as I recall, and it's literally carved by hand. Chisels, rasps, sandpaper, like, you know, they they uh, they carve all this stuff by hand. The necks are carved by hand, you know. And you were talking about the the wood selection process. Like th these are top quality cuts of wood absolutely they're they have a, a library they call it the wood library and it's just shelves and rows and rows and rows of all of this kind of wood wood that they've had in the shop for 20 30 years or longer you know and so you can pull those out and look at them put them back you know and so when i got this base as they were helping me select the, the components like when i saw this top through you know in the email i gasped out loud i was like <gasps> that's it you know it was just so crazy and yeah i love it i the fingerboard wood this is ebony it's macassar ebony ash i love the sound of ash not that you can really make a huge difference but i also like the weight of ash and people say oh, ash is so heavy but uh fodera will select the lightest pieces of ash before they buy it from their suppliers. They weigh it and make sure it, you know, it's light. And, and well, and that's just kind of the the part of the premium that you pay for a base like this. Is Absolutely. That they are meticulous about every little thing. Yeah, and they're... Everything from the, the wood they select to the, the way that they put their inlays in yeah. to in-house made top quality hardware. Mm -hmm. um, the preamps are made in-house. Uh, so this preamp is, is made for Fodera, by Fodera. Yeah, it's, Just it's the, killing. The boutique of boutique. Yeah. So all of that is multiplied by the people themselves. Everyone that I have worked with at Fodera, they're, they're just stellar human beings. Um, and I love them. They're... Uh, Vinny and Laura both are just really close friends and, and Joey and Mike Bandy and like just and Dan and everybody at the shop is, is you know like it's so good to see them when I go to the shop I hug everybody I see it's like oh give me a hug you know <laughs> and Rob and just everyone at the, at the shop the people are so cool and they uh, they love that I love their instruments and that's that's tremendous um when I made the video, the unboxing, there were there were people that watched that video that ended up working at Fodera because of my video. They're like, I want to work for that company because I want customers to do that when I make a base. You know, it's like <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah, it's it's crazy. So I think that there's a lot of um, emotional value to the instrument and. I, like I said, I, I got lucky, really, you know, with the gig with my dad and, and got one. When I put out that video, um, the, the guy that was doing the, the sales and stuff, they, they reached out to me and, like, we love your video. We love your website. I had made a new website with pictures of it. You know, I was so excited to have a Federa. It was just like a dream come true. 
And they're like, we'd love for you to be an artist for us. I was like, okay, what do I gotta do? They're like, well, don't just order another bass. Another one? <laughs> yeah. What, what was the next yeah. one? This is the second one I got, and it's the twin sister. Okay. So in every way, pretty much the same thing, just fretless. Yep, yep. So the top, of course, is different, obviously, but it's the same instrument, same specs, same electronics, same everything, but fretless. me about like the kind of work that this opened up for you like when, when um, you got this bass what did that enable you to do because you obviously have to like justify it somehow with like making it work for you when I got these instruments um, and you know it could have been luck it could have been chance it could have been oh okay he's the guy in town that does this but I got a gig playing uh, with the musical wicked and that book requires a fretless a fretted and an upright bass for the book. And I used the twins for that gig. And uh, it was so much fun. I was, uh, I was on tour with them for eight weeks, or maybe nine. It was a while. And I played uh, the musical in the pit, playing these instruments. It was so killing. And because of that gig, I could get my next Fodera, I ordered another one after that. <laughs> I'll show you that one. Yeah. Suffice to say that that buying premium instruments um, led you not just to have like a really nice bass for for the gigs that you were doing, but it also introduced you to people and opportunities. Absolutely, absolutely. Not not saying that you should try and buy your way into the music industry, but no. But when I, when I became an artist with Fodera, I joined the ranks of all the other Fodera artists. You know, like I knew Victor already, but. You know, it was it was just something cool to say, hey, look, look at my Federa, you know. That was cool. And, you know, uh, there are other people. Like, I reached out to and became friends with another bass player in L.A. named Carlito Supuerto, and he's a killing player. He's on so much stuff, so many things. And, you know, maybe someday he'll help me get a gig. But we're connected because of these instruments, because of that family, because he knows the same people I know, and loves the same people at the factory that I do. And, you know, it's, it's really a tight-knit sort of community. It's really cool. My gig with Wicked paid for this bass. The, the, this, this, is is, the bass. this is the bass that you're going to be able to bring and have nobody yell at you because right. it's more normal. <laughs> It's like, and, and they don't yell at me. They go, oh, what a pretty bass, because it's gorgeous. It, and, it, and for them, it was a challenge. They had never made a, 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 this color before. So it was a, it was a challenge for the shop to, to do it. And, you know, when I, so with the gig money from Wicked and my artist discount, I could, I could get it. You know? So I, I pay for all these instruments, though, and they're still five-figure instruments. You know, it's, it's crazy. But like I said, you know, you get into the custom thing and you're paying for the, the VIP experience. And not everybody needs that, really. You know, I've got instruments in my collection that are not this expensive. I have a factory Ibanez that I love, that I've had for 20 years. This is a signature model, first generation Gary Willis bass. And uh, he just, they, they actually just dropped their 25th anniversary version. I mean, it's such a great bass. And I've played so many gigs on this thing. That's a little dirty pot. That comes from playing so many gigs on this thing. <laughs> I know. I've probably played, I don't know. I, I've done, in the years that I had this bass, in 20 years, gosh, I don't know. Maybe half my gigs are on this bass, I swear. It's just, I use it all the time. A little mark. Yeah, I put it on there. <laughs> it's not inlaid, it's a vinyl sticker. Gets the point across. But yeah, it's the signature mark. So I love this bass. It cost me 1200 bucks. 
right? <laughs> well, you know, retail, I think they're they're four grand, right? So this is a it's an upper yeah, upper yeah. factory tier. But also, I still have my very first base. I, it's changed a lot, you know. This <laughs> this is my Squire, but now it's a piece of art. It's Literally, a, it says Fender Squire in in Mandoa Mandalorian font. Yep. <laughs> uh, this this jazz bass, it's an American standard jazz bass. What year? Uh, two thousand two. Okay, yeah, pretty standard, just regular yep. old jazz bass. It would have been about twelve hundred bucks. I got it for three hundred bucks because I worked at a music store that was going out of business. <laughs> that's that's the real takeaway and, uh, here. Is it's all about who you know and who can give you discounts. <laughs> really, you know how to schmooze. I talked about my in my six string bass video. I talk about the Washburn that I had. That was only eight hundred bucks, and I used it for almost twenty years before I I got rid of it. You know, um, and. And, and happily, my, too, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. I had no problem. I've recorded a ton on that. This bass was 300 bucks. It's this little mini thing. Let me plug it in so you can hear it. I don't even know if they make these anymore, but it's a bass <laughs> by um, Samick. 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 Yeah. Are they even still around? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> but there was a designer named Greg Bennett, so it's a Greg Bennett design mini Corsair is what it's called. And I put, I modded it to get a little bit of better sound. It just, it sounds like, sounds like a P-Bass. Let me play with the pick, hold on. They're gonna explode. When I show up and I go, hmm, you don't like six strings, seven strings? How about this mother? You know what I mean? It's hilarious. It's the anti like, Everybody's like, what? <laughs> what is it? And then they hear it and they're like, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's like, who cares what the instrument is? Can they do the job that you've, you've asked them to do? Mm -hmm. you know, that's really the trick. So, like, um, my, my philosophy with it has been, like, does your gear solve a problem that you have? Right. And I think with with all the Federas that I own now, it's it's been for me part of my uh, emotional connection to music, like that part of my journey. Um, so, like for example, my four string that has thirty frets, um, that was a gift to myself for being a bass player for thirty years. And while I was getting that bass, while I was out in New York picking it up. I had a dream, a literal dream, about the mini six string that I got. Let me grab that and show you. That yeah. Quick. Really, the key is how well are you a, a a player? How good are you as a player? That's the key. Can you play a three hundred dollar instrument and sound good? Can you play a twenty thousand dollar instrument and sound good? Oh, you know? he, here's a question for you. Yeah. Do you have to earn an expensive bass? Uh. I think that's a philosophical question more than that's, it is a practical one. Yeah. I mean, I have earned these. I, because you know. some people feel like like if you haven't achieved much musically or or if you can't justify it somehow, like, bu budget aside, like, do you earn a, an expensive bass? Like, if you're going to be the guy that shows up to a gig with, with a really nice high-end bass and then you don't play that well, is, is that a whole mm. thing? I don't know. Like, you know, I don't I know. I honestly don't know where I stand on this either. I, I say that if you are, if you can afford it and it inspires you to get better, it inspires you to play every day, it inspires you and it feels good in your hands and, you know, who cares? It's your money, number one, and it's your time, number two. So I feel like um, I've earned these instruments because I've been playing bass for 32 years. Yeah, you've been working a, a working professional for Long many, time. many years. Yeah, since I was 16 years old, I've, I've been doing gigs. Right. Do you feel like you wouldn't so, have these if you still had like the same 
passion and drive for music, but maybe you didn't have the same kind of earning opportunities with them. Like if they weren't earning you money, do you feel like you would feel the same about them? Um, I know that's a tough question. I don't know. Like (laughs) it, that's, that is, that's a, that's a very speculative because I don't know. Like, let's say I started playing bass and then I quit when I was 25. But I still wanted to play stuff like John Petit 2G6 string stuff. I would probably have a Yamaha, just a cheaper one, like a less expensive one. Not cheaper as in quality, but a less expensive instrument. Just from the sake of, uh, you know, how am I able to justify owning it monetarily? So maybe, yeah, like, you kind of want to earn them. But also... You know, it's it's a very fine line because if you've got the money and you know that you can do it and, you know, you want to have one, who, who, who what's stopping you? You know, if I had 200 grand laying around, I'd go buy a Ferrari. Do I need a Ferrari? No. But I would <laughs> sure love one. It would be a lot of fun. You know, and I say that about these instruments. They are the Ferrari of, of uh, bass guitars. They yeah. really are. You know, like in their to- quality, craftsmanship. How they sound, how they perform, how it feels, you know. But this, this is the dream base. I had a dream about this. Yeah. And well, I and never to re- reiterate, nobody needs this kind of a base. You could do everything that you need to do, professionally or otherwise, on this, on very inexpensive on stuff. Literally, this little thing for kids. But just because of your commitment to the craft and and what you can appreciate as far as like the the craftsmanship of the instrument and what it enables you to do kind of does justify a bass like this for you. Totally. And that's why they're in business. Because <laughs> I'm not alone. You know, there are people that, that buy these, and, and they're not super great players, I'm sure. I don't know them, but I'm sure they're out there. And who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Are they loving to playing bass? Probably. Yeah. Maybe all they do is sit on their couch and play, play with, you know, musician or something. I don't know. Maybe that's all they ever do. But they've got a foot era because it makes them feel good inside. I have them... Like, my story is is long and, you know, complicated, but it's it's part of me now. Like, and I'm, look, I'm wearing this swag. Like, it's, they're, they're family to me. They're so good. Like, look, look at this inlay. Like, this is done by hand, you know? Like, oh, you need to show the, this the, stuff. You need to show the ramp. Oh, the ramp. This is something that Fodera invented. So people play with ramp, but they have this. Patent pending, right? <laughs> it's so rad. It's so cool. I need to dust it. Like, what? Now it's, you know, no ramp, so I can s- s- slap on it and pick what, play a pick. And then. Or you can pop it out and behave. And then behave myself. <laughs> and play, you know, Gary Willis style, whatever. So it's a short scale. You can watch uh, the video of it. Single coil. Pickups, North Strand, big blades. Oh, let's put the ramp in. Slap mode engaged. All logic. You can't have a short scale low B that sounds good. That's impossible. Well, it's because it's got sparkly magic, unicorn magic on it. That's yeah. why. Yeah. Yeah, that level of detail I feel like you don't really appreciate until you've been playing for a long time and you've played a lot of different bases. Yeah, uh, before I even thought about getting a Federa, I wanted to get a like a nice Yamaha fretted six string, like a Patitucci signature or something, TRB, because they're really nice. Uh, again, I said I had the carbon stuff, you know, and so if I if I didn't have sort of the fortune, as it were, to get uh, that first Fodera, I don't know that I'd have one because they were they're they're you know generally so much more expensive than what I was able to provide. But I got lucky and I just stayed with it. I stuck with it. I don't know if it's manifestation law of attraction whatever you want to call it <laughs> prayers answer i don't know you know i don't know how it all works um but but yeah it's it's been amazing to have instruments like this and you know if i showed up on a gig nobody's really going to know 
unless they're a bass player, nobody's really going to know that I'm playing a, a five-figure instrument, you know? Yeah. But also, if I played my... Nobody's going to know that this is a five-figure instrument, you know? Oh, yeah. You're 65? 65. 65 jazz bass. Yeah. Basically, barely pre-CBS. <laughs> barely. <laughs> if you look at the calendar dates. And I'm the second owner of this bass. This was purchased in January of 1966 for $300. The owner oh yeah, told me about dude! It. Isn't it crazy? Like three hundred dollars used to be the top end of, of like American-made instruments, Wild. and now you can buy a bass for any price, and they kind of start at about three hundred. Yeah. <laughs> Unless yeah. you want to get really cheap with it, which I don't recommend. Yeah. This was the most expensive Federer I had uh, until I got this one. This little guy beat, beats the seven string out by about fifteen hundred bucks. Whew. Yeah. And I'm sure a big chunk of that is this fancy inlay. Yep, and that is inlaid. It is not a sticker Across or paint. the pickup. Like, stuff like this, yeah. you just cannot get anywhere else. Nobody else would do that. Yeah, and it's hard to see, but the, the border of the heart around the tiger is blue. And that's lapis lazuli. And then, the black and then that's ebony. On the other and then the white is holly. And then it's got a holly back. There's just so many little things about this. You just zoom in and find more little things. And that's why it's a very expensive instrument. I love seeing how you look at these things, too. Just you can like, just tell, like, like even just, though you've had these for years and stuff, you just still, like, can't help but look at it. Yeah. Just marvel at it. And look, you can see right here. I play them. It's got a knit. I, I hit it on something. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm sure lots of swear words came out. <laughs> but, you know, I don't, they're not shelf queens, man. I use yeah. these. I mean, if you take the Ferrari out on the track, it's going to get some rocks in mm -hmm. it. And, and I, the only reason I sold the, the Conklin and the Warwick um, and the Carvins is when I got these Federas, I stopped playing them. I literally stopped playing them. They were sitting there gathering dust because I was too busy taking my Ferrari to the track. And, uh, you know, so my, my nice, really nice, you know, Lexus or whatever you want to call them, bases were just get it going unused. It was, it, and it's just better. Like, I, with that Conklin, I could play it, but over time I would get really tired. And I, I couldn't play it for very long. Oh. And it was very heavy. It probably weighed, I don't know, 15, 19 pounds. It was heavy. Weight was a big reason why I got my, uh, my second Sarek. Yeah, these, these comfort straps that I found saved my life with that, with that Conklin. And I could, I could play it on a gig. But man, it wore me out. It really did. And it hurt my hand after a while. And when I got this bass, this bass weighs, uh, you know, for a seven string, I think it weighs 11 pounds. That's but, absurd for, for how big of a bass that is. Though. Yeah, it's so light. If I take the strap off, this, this is something crazy. It just balances there. This thing is perfectly balanced. It, it, is, it is really important that an instrument balance, in my yeah, opinion. So... <laughs> when, you, when everything is built that closely to perfection, mm -hmm. that eliminates all of the speed bumps and all of the hindrances yeah. that you might occur. And they might be tiny, and you may not even notice them, Unless you're you're trying to do stuff that's pretty advanced, or you just have a discerning ear or hand or whatever yeah, you want to call like, it. Yeah, like I I can't I can't play a Thunderbird. I just can't. <laughs> I can't play them. I I wanted to get one when I was younger, and I was like I tried one, and I was like, oh my god, I can't play this. Never looked back. <laughs> you know, because you let go of it, and it goes. Wait, you know? did did you try an Epiphone or was it a Gibson? Because the Gibson <laughs> ones don't do that. Oh. I'm told. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even care at this point. You're a connoisseur. You just you just notice the small things. You appreciate the tiny details, and it takes a lot of time and experience to get to where you would even appreciate all of the little things about a bass like this. Like I, I feel like I you could drop that in my hands, and I don't think that I would have the same kind of reaction as you, just because of my inexperience yeah. by comparison. Sure. It's like. Someone who drives a Toyota their whole life, and you put them behind the wheel of a Porsche, and then they learn how to drive a Porsche, and then you give them a Lamborghini, 
and it's just that you know, yeah. just that the skill required to handle you know twelve hundred horsepower, like it's just a, it's it's sort of a stretch for an analogy, but also you know, no, it kind of works. Kinda it kind of works. Like you're you're not you're not you don't know what you're you're missing out until you understand why it's there. Yeah, and that that really is it. I feel like um, when I get criticized for spending so much money on instruments. Um, there's just a little bit of a lack of understanding about why. And I hope this video helps helps your viewers and mine too, because it's crazy. It is crazy. 